everybody welcome back to strange films uh tonight i got to speak with brandon ingram the creator of dismay comics so uh i got to speak with brandon uh he um reached out to me about a month or so ago and he was wanting to promote his new book dismay avenue um so he's it's actually two issues number one and number two uh both together that's over 100 different pages of artwork I think there's five anthology stories all together with at least four different artists. And every story has its own unique artwork to it. And it's honestly pretty impressive, pretty amazing to, to see. I read it, and it was, it was fucking cool. Um, it's a horror anthology, so lots of dark themes and twists in it and whatnot. Uh, he ha currently has a Kickstarter going on, which is... Um, uh, f for the printed version of these books and uh, I gotta say they're pretty damn cool um, but what was cooler was speaking with Brandon and actually getting to know him as far as a creative goes and learning about how he operates um, his mindset it was really interesting and also inspiring to to know that he is um, just just being a pure creative and doing it for the love and passion of making comic books. And what was even cooler was that he's kind of offering himself for um, a kind of a mentorship as far as other indie creators go and if they're ever needing advice or anything like that. So it's a really great conversation, a uh, really cool, humble guy. Definitely recommend checking out Dismay Comics and Dismay Avenue. Uh, all the links to that, those in the, is in the description below. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, get to know Brandon, hope you enjoy the interview and let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Brandon Ingram. How you doing, Brandon? Thanks for joining me today. Doing pretty good. Thank you for having me. All right. Yes. I'm glad to have you. Uh, you reached out to me a while back, uh, in regards of your comic book. Uh, we've got Disney comics. Is, is that, I guess, is that your, um, your your company or like your production label, yeah that, you that's say. like the the brand name basically yes. the reason i created that is comic conventions you have to have like a company name oh yeah and so disney comics basically and then yes. yeah disney avenue under disney comics pretty much awesome yeah so disney avenue is the book that um we're going to talk about today and we've got two issues number one and number two that's currently on kickstarter which is uh which is awesome platform i've used kickstarter plenty of times and uh it's always proven to be if you've got the support behind it, I mean, it, it does wonders as far as like getting your stuff out there and finding new audiences and stuff. But oh, yeah. for uh, my listeners um, today, uh, watching this video and, and hearing you today, uh, why don't you give a little bit of a background of you and kind of how you got started in comics and what your role is as far as uh, creating Disney Comics and Disney Avenue? Yeah, so kind of my background where I started is. When I was a little kid, I've, I've kind of always loved comics since I was like seven or eight. I picked up a shoebox full of comics at a yard sale, like Amazing Spider-Man, Superman. Like it was a whole bunch of stuff and really got into to reading comics then. And then when I was in high school, I got into picking up issue by issue of like New 52, Batman and stuff like that. And then after high school is when I got into... Uh, actually writing comics like i liked writing like writing screenplays and stuff like that but it wasn't until after high school where i was like hey, why not try writing comics as well um and so kind of adjusted towards there as i was writing screenplays and stuff um and then pretty much from there uh sought after artists to to work with to actually make the comics and stuff because i'm a writer i i edit the comics i do everything with the comics i make except the art and with comic books art is a very a, a very important thing with it um and i'm not a great artist i admire art i love art um but stick figures is about the extent for me <laughs> so uh so reaching out to these artists and working with them I uh, started doing that pretty much early 2019. And from there, it's just kept rolling on. Like, I, I absolutely love it because at first it was like a bucket list thing. It was like, I want to make a comic, like one comic. I'll make one comic. And then right as I started, not even like uh, uh, I got maybe one page back from an artist. That was pretty much it. I got one page back. I was like, 
okay, this is going to be more than a bucket list. Mm. Like I want to do a lot more of these and, and make it as big and grand as I can. And so that's kind of how it all started. Like my love for making comics. Awesome. So this is as far as um, creating Disney comics and getting started in the creative process of that. It's still kind of relatively new in the last just a few years. Yeah, I, I've been writing uh, screenplays and stuff since like 2014, 2015, and then started writing, like changing some of it into comics around like 2017, roughly. Um, I've always loved comics. So I'm always reading mm -hmm. them. Um, but yeah, like actually working with artists on making comics and stuff. Yeah, that that started pretty much three and a half years ago, March yeah. or April of 2019. So, yeah. So you and I have kind of something similar as far as that goes. Um, so Strange Films is a multimedia production company that I, that I run. And um, I mainly do films and, and I, you know, so writing screenplays and adapting them to movies is kind of my my gig. But back in 2018, we released this short film called Cindy's Birthday Party, which uh, was doing really well in uh, the, the, fest the festival circuit and online and everything. But I just had this crazy idea where i was like i would love to turn like i would love to make a comic book and yeah, what, yeah. What, what better would be to uh take one of our original stories that we made on film and adapt it into a comic book and it wasn't until 2019 when we published our very first comic as well and it was just one of those That's things awesome. where you kind of like you said it was like a bucket list thing but then once you do it do it you're like whoa this is amazing and yeah I, it, it's actually doable for an independent artist and creator to self-publish and everything like that too and and oh yeah have that physical item in your hand and, and have it to give it to other readers and stuff so it's uh so i can't you know now we're on our third one it's just interesting to i like i like that story man so um so disney avenue we've got two issues so far and it's uh i guess i would describe it as a anthology kind of like a horror yeah, yeah. horror anthology which i found really fascinating i mean um first of all they're they're long issues each one are like the first one I think was like 40 something pages and the, the yeah, other yeah. one was like 60 or something. And um, the first one is centered around one story while the other one has like four different stories within it. Um, and I want you to be able to pr present this in your own words, but I definitely, I, I really enjoyed the variety of styles mainly um, from every artist between these five stories. And thank you. Um, you know, you got stuff that kind of reminded me of like manga anime. You had like the kind of like a watercolor painting on one of them. You had one that really reminds like Archie fifties comics, you know, like, you know, one that's more of a classic modern stuff, you know? So like really, really interesting styles and all great like premises and twists and cool imagery and stuff like that too. So, so yeah, let's dive into, um, Disney Avenue number one and two and kind of, um, I guess, yeah, take it away on that one. Yeah, so so with the writing these comics and stuff, like a huge inspiration like is horror, like horror as a landscape, with, whether it's the the literature I've read or, or the shows I've watched or the movies I've watched, <clears throat> it's huge influence. But a major influence for stuff like Disney Avenue is The Twilight Zone, like Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone. Um, absolutely love that show. Rod Serling to me is... A master when it comes to short horror stories as well as like uh, uh just just getting it within that 22 minute mark and it feel like big and epic and then it's like oh that was like 22 minutes what um yeah so that was a huge influence on me so with something like disney avenue the first issue um like you said the first story it, it is one story it's 40 pages long and then there's some backup stuff and then a one page uh horror comedy backup to kind of alleviate some of the the tension or whatever that may have built up from the first main story but uh yeah so issue one it follows a couple ben and mia who go on a movie date night and the movie date night it's they go to a movie theater on the outskirts of town um huge cineplex but it's like dead there's no one in the parking lot, no cars in the parking lot. It's just two concessions workers and some kind of weird, creepy, shady guy with his hoodie pulled over off in the lobby corner. Um, and like a real couple, they're like whispering to each other, like, 
this is kind of weird. And they're kind of like jokingly like creeping each other out or freaking each other out, that sort of stuff. Um, and as that date night goes on, it does spiral into this, this crazy psychological horror. Um, and that story, the first third of it is like completely true. It was like a date night that I went on back in college with a girl and, uh, all this weird stuff was happening. And then the tension died and it's like, Oh, the, it wasn't this creepy thing that we were right. joking and thinking about. The story is basically a what if, like what if it went this creepy uh -huh. psychological horror route? Um, and yeah, like you had mentioned, the artwork for that is very like painterly, uh -huh. like beautiful, atmospheric. Um, Jade Sky, the artist for that story, knocked it out of the park. Um, so yeah, that's issue one, over 40 pages of story. I absolutely love it. Um, then issue two, you had mentioned it's four stories. It's four, four whole stories in issue two, over 60 pages of comic just with that one. And the first story, Tolls the Bells, follows a little boy who has to stay after school one day because he gets in trouble. And creepy stuff starts happening with him having to stay for de detention, basically. Um, it, 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 it tackles like some of the the fears of like isolation and, and darkness, kind of like darkness the the element um and, and you had mentioned the the manga art that is definitely where that story is i can tell right because, the way i was like whoa this is this is cool yeah exactly because that one like yes all all of these stories i should also mention the the storytelling and the art are intentional like together and with that one the manga that it is definitely inspired of is stuff like junji ito like his horror art that he does and his horror stories. Cause the story itself feels kind of like a Junji Ito story. And then when mm -hmm. you see the art and some of the crazy creatures and stuff, it's like, yeah. that seems like something Junji Ito would do. Very and, bizarre. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Gaetano, the artist for that knocked out of the park. Then the second story, raw horror again, kind of dreamlike surreal because it's, it's a uh, Jade sky. She's doing the art for that one as well. And it follows a military soldier who wakes up at his house, but it feels very unfamiliar and kind of weird horror stuff starts happening from there. Um, and then the third story, uh, that being Destination, follows a little girl who goes to a thrift shop with her mom. And the mom's like, hey, just go look around, like, because the girl's kind of bugging her, like, go look around. And little girl finds like a mystical triangle in the thrift shop. And when she strikes it, she gets sent to other dimensions. So each time she strikes it, it's another dimension. And it, it gets crazier each time and worse each time. Like each dimension is just worse than the last, basically, for her. Um, and that art style is very much like you had talked about, that, that more uh, modern contemporary art style. But Federico, the artist of that, is able to do lighting very well. So there's like some beautiful lighting in that. So that's that one. And then the last story for issue two is Acolyte, which is like you were talking about that, that Dr. Seuss-esque art style slash like Archie fifties comic art style. That's intentional. Um, that follows a guy named Mr. Hinklehorn, which that's a Dr. Seuss name right there. Basically. <laughs> I really Mr. love the names and all that. Uh, yes. In thank that you. Whole, I, I, Cause I noticed it as I was reading it, took me like a couple pages in but i was like oh these names are just <laughs> like loose. yeah yeah like, they're, exactly they're fun. yeah and, and that's on purpose because the first few pages it's like before it gets to people like cussing at him and stuff it's like this feels like a dr seuss story this feels like an archie comic mm -hmm. and that's intentional because leads with that and then as it goes on like mr hinklehorn's just getting crap from everyone throughout the day at, at work from his boss uh, in in traffic from other people driving in the store from other customers and stuff. And all while he's getting all this crap from people, he still keeps a smile on mm. his face and just says, oh, thank you, sir, or have a nice day. It's like something's up with Mr. Hinklehorn. This guy has some real creep vibes. And as the story goes along, you get to see like, oh, okay, Mm -hmm. I see what's off about Mr. Hinklehorn. I'll say for those thinking 
I didn't go with the obvious for this. I didn't. He's not a serial killer. Mm-hmm. So you, you can take that that idea out. He's not. Yeah, a no, killer. it's a uh, it, 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 like you just said without spoiling it. I mean, it was I knew something was just way off from the beginning. And, and like this guy was way too happy to, you know, during the whole yeah. thing. Um, and I and I had maybe an idea of where it was going, but it, it, it even that twist went into a twist for me. So it was cool. Um, Thank you. Very, very cool. So it sounds like with all of these stories, as you mentioned, um, it was very intentional and thought out um, going into these different styles and whatnot um, and, and, and stories, because that was going to be one of my questions for you. I, I work with a lot of different artists um, between my comics and uh, my artwork for my posters and stuff like that. And normally when I, when I approach an artist, I, I kind of base it off of their style and I, and I say, this is kind of what I'm thinking, but feel free to have as much creative freedom as you want. And uh, in your interpretation, what you're thinking and, and, you know, and then nine times out of 10, their ideas and their interpretations of kind of what I was trying exceeded my expectations yes. and ideas at first. So like for for the like the manga um story just to for example was that something you were like i know i want it in like a manga style or is it like you kind of presented this idea to your artist first and then they translate it into that style and then you're like whoa this is this is awesome like with uh issues one and two in particular i had the stories um already wrote out for turning into a comic um so and, and I had the idea of what each art style would look like, at, at least with issue two, I should say, because issue okay. two, I was making that before I made issue one. Um, so I was looking for four different artists. I was looking for I, I want someone that can do black and white manga art style. Um, at that time, I wasn't entirely sure if I wanted that kind of Junji Ito route. But when I found Gaetano, I saw his portfolio and the strengths that he had. And I was like, let's, let's play off of your strengths. Like, like I I see in some of your work, you have like some creepy monster stuff here and there. Like you don't have a lot, but I see you are amazing at that. You have a ton of strengths, but I want to see you do more of that because it looks amazing. And then boom, you get like the crazy conjoined from the nose monster and, Mm -hmm. and tolls the bells and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, like, like with the others, like Jade Sky, Raw Horror was the first comic she did. And I was looking for that dreamlike, surreal, atmospheric art style to, to fit the story. And I found her through Deviant Art. And then once she was done with that, I had program from uh, issue one, the movie theater one. I was like, hey, like, do you want to like, I'll hire you for this because I think you could do this because originally when i wrote program i didn't envision that kind of atmospheric painterly Mm -hmm. look to it but after i saw her do raw horror and i saw some of her other work i was like i think it could work like this and ultimately i think it it worked great in that route and then yeah stuff like uh destination i wanted that more contemporary art style slash kind of looks um and, and this is a compliment, like the good webtoon comics out there, that oh, art style, yeah. it looks like a contemporary comic art style with a little bit of that webtoon uh, flavor to it. And then with the last one, definitely I was, I from the beginning, when I started writing Acolyte, I was like, the art has to be Dr. Seuss-like. Like that's how it has to be. So with those stories in issue two, the the story as i was writing it was like it has to i have to find someone that can do this type of art style but as i've worked on other stories and other comics like a lot of times it can be like uh uh i'm writing towards that person's strengths Mm -hmm. like i see the artist and i'm like i want to write a story based on their art and their strengths and their art yeah no that's definitely cool i mean uh having that vision from the begin with makes the difference because it's like, you know what you're trying to yeah. accomplish, you know, versus 
having a vague idea and kind of there's really nothing wrong with either process, but it's just it's it's cool to know that you had that vision from the start for those particular styles and you found it seems like you found the perfect artist for every every single one. I mean, oh, yeah. and they're and they're all very very engaging from the first page of each each story you know it's it's really neat to kind of you know every in, to, to see each story going to different style was really exciting for me because it made me even more interested to keep reading um and, and, and see what's coming up so well that's awesome and um so the books are done from what i've read and they're you know and i've and everything so but we have a kickstarter going on for you at the moment uh, that you guys launched and you guys are already overfunded from what I saw as well. Still has a few days left, I believe on it, but um, tell us the process of kind of launching the Kickstarter and marketing it and everything like that. And maybe some of the overall feedback that you've gotten and what, what um, people can expect if they pledge to the campaign itself. Yeah. So regarding uh, uh, kind of starting the Kickstarter, this is my fourth, uh, kickstarter i've done so i've i've learned a lot mm -hmm. through and, and even whenever i do my fifth kickstarter there'll be a lot i learned from this one um it just improves each time but uh yeah it, a big part of that marketing is luckily i've done some kickstarters in the past and i'll mention my very first kickstarter that i did two two and a half years ago that one failed but that was because i had no idea how to really run a Kickstarter. Like basically I was, I was posting in like Facebook groups and stuff like that, like indie comic Facebook groups. I was posting in that and that was about it. Like, like I, I didn't reach out to family and friends until like a week or two into the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I kind of shot myself in the foot with uh, that first one, but I learned a ton from that first one. Like, uh, uh, the comic was good, but it was ultimately, I learned a crap ton about marketing mm -hmm. with a Kickstarter from that first one. And then I carried that over to my second Kickstarter. That one did great. We, we raised over, uh, uh, 200% of the funds. And then my third one would raise almost 300% of the funds. Then this one, uh, we're doing better than the previous Kickstarters. Um, a big part with the marketing on this is, and this wasn't even like I, I because it's horror, I was like, I'm going to have this come out in September or October, like the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. because it's like hey, spooky time. Like I, I could have it come out at any time, but I was like, yeah, like I'll, I'll try it then. It'll probably do pretty decent. It, it's done a lot better than I thought. And then I guess it's just this year because I haven't seen years like this before everyone has a kickstarter right now in october or november because yeah. everyone's trying to get in at the tail end for tax purposes and stuff like that um but uh even amidst that it's been doing very well so i'm still happy about that but yeah like i i still post in the the facebook groups and stuff like that but since my first kickstarter like in the past two years I, i've uh gotten a lot of friends through through youtube through instagram and all this stuff and they they help spread the word they they uh will have me on shows and different stuff like that to help spread the word about the comic um ultimately yeah a huge part of the marketing is like for anyone that wants to do a kickstarter one day like plan months in advance uh -huh. that's a big thing plan months in advance like work up like decent looking posts and stuff like that posts aren't everything but do definitely do that major thing is reach out to people like uh whenever i reached out to you or other people like i i reached out over a month in advance from most people usually uh i reached out like two months in advance and stuff like that because people they they got schedules and uh if you're running a comic you have to keep that in mind so you need to reach out uh sooner rather than later um for for people to help spread the word but that was a huge part in the marketing i think it's it's definitely helped a lot and then i'm trying to remember sorry what was what was the, oh, it's okay. uh, of the question yeah yeah i always do that i always ask you're like good you're questions good with one but um so i guess as far as like the rewards and stuff for the kickstarter um 
obviously I'm, I'm assuming people can get the physical copies of these books. Um, what other kinds of things are uh, you guys offering on the Kickstarter? Yeah, so I, I do want to first mention that uh, this is the only way online to get these books is through the Kickstarter. Like I don't have an online store or anything like that. I don't plan on getting one in, in at least a few years. Uh, so these are the only ways to get these books is through the Kickstarters. Um, kind of as like a, a it's like an event. I, mm -hmm. I like the Kickstarter to feel like an event, like it's special. You're, you're getting in on the ground floor because you are. And, uh, and I don't want to pull like a Boom Studios and have like Berserker Kickstarter. And Berserker is a good book. Don't get me wrong. I like Berserker. But have that Kickstarter and you probably paid 15 plus dollars for the book. And then three, four months later, Berserker number one is in all the comic shops for $3.99. Uh -huh. And it's like, what's so special about my paying $15 plus to help fund the book and everyone else gets it for four bucks? I don't want to do that. So, yeah, the, the only way to get it is through the Kickstarters. And it ends uh, November 18th, uh, noon Central Standard Time, November 18th. Um, and so some rewards that are with this Kickstarter, <clears throat> they range for any budget. There's a tier for any budget. It ranges from $1 to $60. So example of this is issue one. Again, over 40 pages of comics. You can get that digitally for five bucks. You can get issues one and two digitally. That's over 100 pages of comics for $9. Uh, physical copies start at $11. Uh, there's a... a $25 great value bundle, which is uh, both books signed uh, by me. Plus you get a sticker and bookmark set um, and a few other things. You get a, the PDF copies and all that and a few other things for just 25 bucks. Uh, there's also an exclusive Disney Avenue t-shirt for this, which is really cool. I love this t-shirt. I'm getting one. My sister was like, hey, get me one. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll get you one uh it's really cool so if anyone goes to the kickstarter page it's that the thumbnail of the little boy basically reaching out from the manga type story that's the t-shirt so you'll just have like a vortex on your chest with this little boy reaching out it looks really cool so that exclusive t-shirt it's a uh, 18 dollars plus shipping and then uh there's retailer bundles for for comic retailers out there we've already had I think at least two um, get that. And then there is a creator value bundle. It's at $60. It comes with <clears throat> pretty much everything from the Kickstarter, like both books, both variants of the books, all four of those signed, um, sticker and bookmark sets, uh, PDF copies, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Comes with that and comes with digital copies of the scripts, like my script, so you can look at it. You can read it. You can be like, oh, I can learn a lot from this. Like, he's a decent writer. Or it can be like, oh, I can learn a lot from this. I can see what not to do and write. <laughs> yeah. whatever, whatever it works for you. Um, and you also get a two-hour Zoom script consultation with me, which wow. I'll, what that'll be is you'll send the script ahead of time. I'll read it ahead of time, do notes ahead of time. And then that two hours that we're actually talking on Zoom is going over some of those me asking you questions, you asking me questions. Um, so me reading it, that's not going to be during the two hours because that'd blow right, your time. Yeah, it'd just be, basically, it'd be two hours of me reading it and very little feedback. But I want the most uh, bang for your buck for writers out there. Yeah. So those that's are some of the tiers. That's pretty impressive. Um, I mean, as far as all those rewards go, that's, I feel like that's pretty cool standard stuff, but like that extra two hour zoom call, that's a, that's a big, that's a big, you know, not only commitment for you, but really beneficial for creators and people and stuff like that. So that's really neat to, uh, to offer that. Um, is that something you typically, uh, try to do in general with indie creators? Like just, you know, work with them, kind of do consultations like that, or is that something new you're trying to just start because in the future you want to do kind of take on that kind of role? I, I would like to take on that kind of role in the future. Um, cause I, I do want to continue making comics, but I also wouldn't mind 
uh, having more of an editorial role over some comics here and there, like let other people take the reins of writing some comics and it not be all Brandon has to do everything sort of mm -hmm. thing. I want, I want to see other people get into it, but, um, but yeah, it's, I, I started doing that type of tier um, in my last Kickstarter. It's been going pretty well. So I, I, I did it in this Kickstarter, but also it's one of those things where like over the past couple of years, I've just had people like reach out of like one, it could be like uh, this doesn't pertain to writing, but someone saying like, Hey, like want to see if you're interested in my art or, or check out my portfolio or something like that. And with all of those, I say, yeah, I'll check out your portfolio. It might not be like, Hey, I'll hire you for a story, but at the very least I want to see your portfolio um, and, and may, give you constructive criticism i'm not going to say if it's good or bad i'll say first what are your your strengths like you're doing really good in this keep that up keep working on it but also there might be some stuff here and there where it's like practice more in this i i can see where you're going in this and you're doing good but practice more in this like a big thing i see a lot is uh the anatomy of faces uh, is something that I'll, I'll see sometimes just like, just work on that a little bit more, but everything else looks good. The way the, the anatomy looks, it looks great. Just keep practicing on those spaces. So random stuff like that will happen. And then I've had, uh, uh, a few times over the years, like someone bring a script to me, like through email or through Instagram. And I'll look over it and basically be like, this is good or, or give like some constructive criticism here and there. Like if you're wanting to turn this into your own project, maybe take out some of these uh, uh, properties that you don't own, mm. like, like maybe not use this name brand or whatever it is, stuff like that. Um, at least don't show that in an image. Don't show the, the image in the name brand. Maybe you can say it. But also there's all kinds of other constructive criticism like, hey, like the third act happened way too quick or, or something seems rushed. Maybe you should stretch it out. Maybe you should make it more than one issue, make it two issues or three issues or whatever. But um, to answer your question, I ramble on. That's, that That's is a, a fault of mine. To answer your question, yes, I, I do. Uh, I do enjoy helping other creators because people have helped me along the way. So mm -hmm. I just want to kind of pass it on. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I really appreciate that um, as a creator myself, because I try to do the same when it comes to like the indie film scene around here and everything like that. And um, I'm no, I'm no expert by all means with every Avenue I try to create stuff at, but I've done enough to kind of know what has worked for me and what has yeah, yeah. like that. So when people are just coming up and it's just starting and they have no clue or whatever, it's like, you know, being in a position where you can actually offer some credible advice and, and offer hands-on experience with like, it makes a difference. And it's very fulfilling to kind of do that as well. So, oh, yeah. um, so that's, that's really cool uh, that you're applying that in the, the comic realms and everything. So a um, couple things here, you mentioned, uh you've done previous kickstarters before uh and i just maybe i missed did you have do you have a some comic books you've published before disney avenue um that's out now or that's coming out now yeah the the comics i've published uh so far are issues one and two of my golden age silver age superhero satire parody series called the gallows man Okay. Um, and yeah, issues one and two, I did a Kickstarter for issue one. Um, then I did a Kickstarter for issue two, but it was issues one and two in case people didn't, uh, some didn't read issue one. Um, and that did very well. That's what's like in my, uh, okay, up there, cool. like the, those in the variant mm -hmm. covers and stuff. But, um, but yeah, those were the first ones I published. Disney Avenue issues one and two are the first ones I read and made as, or not read, wrote and made as comics but gallows man was the first one that I actually published like like put out there um so first published but disney avenue is like first one actually worked on nice nice awesome 
Um, well, it sounds like you, I mean, you, you've got a really great strategy when it comes to marketing with your Kickstarters and everything like that. Um, great ideas as far as the creative process goes and everything. Um, you know, I've ran a few Kickstarters myself and, uh, it is, it, it's one of those things, like you mentioned, it's like, you got to really plan for the, uh, you know, the pre-launch and, and the launch and the campaign stay on top of it, you know, and, and it can be very stressful, uh, sometimes discouraging too. But, um, if you, if you have the ideas, you have the right planning, um, and the ideas are interesting enough for people to follow along, it, it, you should be fine with it. But, um, uh, it seems like you've done very well with your campaigns and it's exciting to, for this uh, next event launch with Disney Avenue for people to get their hands on. So um, I guess I wanted to follow into the future of, you know, your work and Disney Avenue, Disney comics, um, everything else in between. And I mean, is this, is writing, is making comics to your full-time job right now? Is this something that you want to just kind of lean into? Like uh, what, what's, what's plans for Brandon in the future? So, I'll first say this is all like a side gig hobby right now, basically. Um, cause, cause I won't even say second job because there's no money being made <laughs> in doing this. So, so I can't I mean, even yeah. say second job. Um, but, but I have a, a, a job that, that brings me income that I love. I, I do love my job, but it's one of those things where if something comes of, making these comics, like if it gets bigger or whatever it may be. Um, and I'm able to, to not make a living, but make money off of comics. Great. Like that'd be awesome. If that never happens or doesn't happen for five, 10 years, I'm still okay with that. Like I'm, I'm in a mindset of I'm making these comics no matter what, mm -hmm. because I just love doing it. I love making it. And I love that even even if it is a small community, I love the community that has been built, that has read my work and likes my work and, and uh, wants to see me keep going. Like I would likely still keep going, but that is encouraging the, the people that do oh, yeah. really like the work. Um, so, yeah, if it turns into a job or me working for a bigger publisher or whatever, like great. If it doesn't, I'm still OK with that. Uh, so when it comes to the comics that will come out, like Gallows Man number three, that's a four issue mini series. Gallows Man is, and uh, each issue is like double size, so it's like forty eight pages long with each issue. Gallows Man number three will come out in the first half of twenty twenty three. Uh, Disney Avenue number three will come out probably around September of twenty twenty three. Um, and maybe in 2023, there'll be a one shot horror uh, that won't be Disney Avenue. It, it doesn't really fit with Disney Avenue, but uh, that might come out as well. Um, but there's also some other series I'm working on because it's one of those things where <clears throat> you go back to some of your old scripts that you wrote or some of your old ideas that you have or old outlines you have. And you haven't touched it in like a year. And then you get back on it. It's like, oh, I just wrote two issues of this thing like and i haven't looked at it in a year so it's one of those things because there are like one example there's one series i know it's going to be a 12 issue maxi series where it's kind of a war uh war drama horror it's a few different uh genres that uh i really like and i have pretty much the whole thing mapped out issue one is completely written Issue two, like, is a very detailed outline. I need to write it. But, yeah, there's stuff like that. There's a bunch of stuff like that where it's like, I have this four-issue miniseries or I have this 12-issue series where the first couple issues are done. They're written. I just need to finish the rest of it. But there are a few series that I hope to start and get out there in the next couple of years. Awesome. And, and... – just to uh, just out of curiosity on my end, because, uh, you know, I've I've done three comics that I've written and, uh, you know, self-published. And I've worked with the same artist for all three issues. Uh, my, my friend Tim Severo and amazing artist and everything. But my I guess my biggest challenge when it comes to 
comic book making is the expense that comes with, you know, the artwork and everything. So like, you know, and seeing you, you clearly have a roadmap of like at least two to three things coming out from next year, which in that timeline, I would imagine you've been already working on stuff towards that and you've got a, a pretty much deadline within six months of each other to kind of finance and get that all ready to go. But, you know, for like the last one we just did, I just got it printed out and took over a year just to kind of get that, get that done because life comes in the way and everything like that. You know, you're spending X amount of dollars per page and, you know, you got to wait on the artwork and stuff like that. So do you find that, I mean, cause I can't even imagine with a 60 page book with Ismay Avenue number two with four different artists who I'm sure has their own, sets of rates, rates and, and stuff yeah, yeah. Rates and colors and everything like that so was that like a huge challenge for you i mean was that something you just kind of chipped away at when you possibly could or um what's that experience like for you it's one of the things that like it, it's so weird in, in like my current state to look back at when i was making disney avenue because there are issues one and two i should say i'm still making disney avenue but specifically issues one and two um because Three years ago, I had basically no money in my bank account. The amount of money I had was the amount of money I paid towards those artists. Um, so it was one of those things, not saying it was a gamble, but it was more of like, this is a hobby and a thing I really want to do. I'm going to go all in in it. I, this chunk of money I have, I'm going to do it. Now, I still had like a tiny bit of money to like pay this month's bills and next month's mm -hmm. bills basically but everything else went towards uh making those comics and now like i mean in a, to, to put it simply i'm in a lot better financial state than i was then um to where i i mean back then i was okay with paying out of pocket it's like why not be okay paying out of pocket now when i'm in a lot better state than i was back then and i chose to do it back then mm -hmm. um it, it is one of those things where uh i'm not married so so there's there's that um and and i have family and i, I love my family and stuff but when it comes to hobbies and stuff like i go to the movies which isn't that expensive when it comes to hobbies uh, I don't care about like cars or, or clothes or anything. So I get thrift store stuff or, or Walmart graphic tees or whatever. Um, and then when it comes to like the big uh, spending hobbies, I, I like collecting original comic art here and there when I have some money and then making comics. Like that's literally the, the big cost of, of, uh, when I have extra money after bills, that's what I like to pour that money into. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just one of those things like uh, it, it's a huge focus in my life. Like one, the main focus is living and, and paying the bills and stuff. But once that's OK, the rest of my focus is in making comics. So it, it's one of those things where I'm just at a OK mindset of uh yeah, like I, I'm willing to to pay these artists um, because I, I want to see this this thing be made. I want to continue my creations and stuff because I, I, I love my job, but this is also another passion that I mm -hmm. have. So it's one of those things. Absolutely. It, you know, it it is all about the mindset. I mean, strange films, everything I've done, it's it's I've paid out of pocket for definitely much in a better position now, like you said, that I'd started six years ago, but um, so I can afford it, even though I'm not making money off of it and whatnot, but it's, I do it because I love it. I do it because exactly. I want to do it. I do it because I want to see it happen. I want to see what other reactions I get out of it, what enjoyments come out of it. And that's going to be everlasting um, that will outlive both of us. You know, like what, your comics are always going to be around. You know, yeah. after you and my films are going to always be around after me and everything like that. And that's something you can just always just be proud of and share, uh, you know, community with um, in the long run of things. But it is something where it's like, uh, you know, you don't it's like the money It is not it's hard to say like a gamble because 
like like you said, but it is kind of like, well, I'm just throwing money out there, but it, it your return on investment's much more than getting money back out of it. It's just exactly like, it's making you feel fulfilled and happy and excited. So I definitely yeah. can can very much relate to that. And uh, yeah, I just I'm always curious because you seem like a really ambitious guy with uh, some really great stuff under your belt and a lot more to come and uh yeah i'm always just curious how the process works you know so um well that is uh that's, that's great i've learned a few things and and everything from you and I'm, I'm i'm really excited for your journey with uh disney comics and disney avenue to uh to be released for those who are backing the project and i'm gonna put the kickstarter link in the uh the youtube video here so people can follow that but if you want to give a uh, uh, I guess the listeners, like any way they can find you uh, on social media or uh, anything else you want to plug in for yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, you can find on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, Disney Comics. It's all the same, Disney Comics, D-I-S-M-A-Y Comics. Um, see my journey of making these comics. Um, also me post random stuff here and there. On TikTok, it's a mix of me making comics and then me collecting comic art or buying new trades or whatever. Um, and then me and a buddy of mine have a podcast called store brand comics. It's on most podcast listening apps, but you can find it on like Spotify or anchor, but store brand comics, basically half of it is us pitching uh, comics or shows or movies like to each other and, and with each other. Um, and it's basically like a, a, a novice writing room because I'm not going to say we're professionals, but it's basically our little writing room is that podcast. So half of it is that it's like we'll do random stuff like a Predator on the Planet of the Apes, like <laughs> Predator, Planet of the Apes crossovers. Like So we'll do crossover stuff. We'll make our own DC movies, make our own Marvel timeline, all that stuff. But we'll also do some original ideas here and there. So that's half the show. The other half the show is us just talking about whatever, rambling about whatever, philosophizing about whatever, whether it be Batman poop or Batman's <laughs> poop, whatever it is. Awesome. Um, that's, that's the podcast. I will warn people, though, our average episode time is like two and a half hours long oh gosh we yeah. just can't shut up uh <laughs> the writing room stuff makes sense because we take time with that but when we're just talking it's like all right these guys need to shut up eventually but we, right. we can't so oh that's fun man i love podcasts dude i have to give it a listen i'm i'm always listening to podcasts on the, on the daily and uh we have our own podcast that me and my buddy run and uh, it's just us just goofing off and talking you know smack about whatever and sharing stories and everything yeah. but uh because ours is basically like a hobby podcast yeah like it, it's for our entertainment but if other people get entertainment out of it that's oh good yeah as well that's great awesome well brandon i really appreciate your time and uh talking with me and uh sharing all your insights and um it, you know advice even for uh kickstarters and indie making and it sounds like you're pretty accessible too so if people reach out to you uh it's good to know that you're looking out for the the indie creators and whatnot as best you oh, yeah. can and everything. Any questions so, people have, I'm willing to to try to help out. Yeah, so that's really cool. I hope everybody checks out um, Disney Comics on social media. Disney Avenue is still you've still got some time to back that project and get yourself a copy of it. And uh, yeah, I'm really really looking forward to seeing what you come up with in the future. And I'm I'm excited to follow your journey. So I appreciate you reaching out to begin with, so we could connect like this and. Uh, and yeah, I'll have all your links in the in the YouTube video below for people to check out. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, I'm going to uh, stop the recording here, but thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Brandon from Disney Comics.